Okay. Uh, thank you for joining today. My name is Christopher Ankerson. I'm a professor here at uh, the Center for Global Affairs, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Zachariah Mompoli, who's going to speak to us today about an article that was published in fall in Foreign Affairs, the Du Bois Doctrine, uh, Race in the American Century, as well as some further thoughts he's got about research into uh, the Black intellectuals in and around that time. Um, Professor uh, Mopoli is holds the Marx Endowed Chair of International Affairs at the Marx School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College here in New York City. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Program on African Social Research, as well as a number of fascinating um, books. I know that many of many of which are used by colleagues like Professor Altier on when she talks about recidivism and uh, rebels. He's got a, a great book called Rebel Rulers, Insurgent Governance and Civilian Life During the War, uh, and a number of others that I would commend, uh, commend to you as well. Um, again, we're going to be looking at uh, most specifically at the work that he did on W.B. Du Bois and how that works out in international affairs. And without any further ado, uh, Mr. Mopoli, the floor is yours. So much, and, and thank you, everyone, for uh, having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you on Valentine's Day. So thank you <laughs> for joining me on Valentine's Day uh, for this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about some research I've been doing, uh, looking at uh, early 20th century intellectuals as a, as a way uh, to try to make sense of the world today. Uh, so I'll kind of divide this into two parts. First, I want to talk a little bit about Du Bois. Um, and I think some of his contributions to the study of international relations as a field. And then I'll talk about uh, what I'm trying to do in this book project is to see what kind of lessons we can take uh, from this era of you know, early 20th century uh, radical intellectuals, is, is especially um, you know, with the focus on folks from throughout the global South, but also the Black American tradition of the United States. Um, so that's the two parts of what I want to do. This is all very preliminary ongoing stuff, so you'll, you'll, you'll forgive me for being a little rough at, at, at points. Um, so the title of this piece was The Voice Doctrine, Race in the American Century. Um, just to give you some context of it as to how I started working on this topic, you know, I, I have uh, my primary research interests have been historically uh, on the African continent and in South Asia. I work on violent and, and non violent um, But I've also always had an interest in American racial politics. They, to me, these are not as disconnected as they may appear, uh, despite the fact that as a political scientist, we tend to bracket, uh, especially Black Americans, from these larger international discourses. Right? And so uh, as somebody who double majored in Africana studies and international relations, um, I was always struck that it was the Africana studies tradition that deployed <clears throat> concepts of race uh, and centered the, the countries of the global south much more forthrightly than the, than the field of international relations. I right? actually learned a lot, lot more about transnationalism, internationalism within Africana studies than I did in international relations. When I went out to get my doctorate, um, you know, I did my doctorate in political science, but I was still very heavily influenced um, by, by scholarship that came out of the Black radical tradition in particular. Uh, and a lot of my work has been applying the insights uh, you know, black scholars from the United States, as well as scholars from throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, to the question of the international. Right? And as I'll talk about here, uh, the history of international relations has been very Eurocentric, uh, and I would say it continues to be very Eurocentric into the current period. And this is not for a lack of alternate uh, intellectual histories that we could sketch. So this is part of that effort uh, to recover the lineages uh, of international relations and situate them outside of the Eurocentric. And I do this not just for simple identity reasons, but I think, as I hope to argue here, uh, that there are enduring lessons that we can glean uh, from the writings of these kind of figures who are often writing from the margins, right? trying to make sense of this shifting world order in ways that are very different than mainstream traditions were doing at the time. Um, okay, so that's the content text for this project. All right, so <clears throat> some of you probably know that uh, Du Bois actually died in Accra, Ghana uh, in 1963. I'll provide a little bit of his biographical information here, but this is, I think, an important picture from his 95th birthday. The man on the left is Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, he was the leader of the independence movement in the Gold Coast, uh, and eventually the first president of Ghana, also a very noted Pan-Africanist who invited Du Bois to come to uh, Accra late in life. 
and I want to emphasize here that Du Bois did not leave the United States free. Um, beginning as early as the 1940s, uh, he was harassed by the United States State Department for his work in the anti-nuclear and peace movement at the time. Uh, and at this point, when he was finally allowed to go to Ghana, uh, it was because you know, the U.S. had just re re returned his passport uh, after taking away his citizenship on the basis that he was a suspected communist. And so he essentially flees to Accra uh, at the invitation of Nkrumah, who invited him to come uh, as a big fan of his work. And he dies in 1963 in Accra, uh, where he is buried today. The key thing to, to start with, I think, with Du Bois is that he did not die in the United States. He actually took Ghanaian citizenship, and his citizenship had been revoked by the United States. So as much as we celebrate, rightly, uh, du Bois as a, a great African American figure. Uh, it's important to recognize that he also had citizenship uh, in an African country, uh, specifically Ghana. This is a picture I took over the summer when I was doing a little research for this trip of the WEB -E Du Bois Memorial Center, uh, which is Du Bois' final resting place in Accra. Uh, this is, uh, was the house that he spent his final years in Accra. Um, as you can see, it's not very nice. Um, I think this is something that is you know, quite scandalous considering the stature uh, that Du Bois occupied, shows the relative neglect of Du Bois as a historical figure. I know the idea of, of suggesting that Du Bois is neglected can be uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, obviously, there are prizes, centers, uh, all kinds of scholarship that is devoted to Du Bois, uh, but a large part of his legacy has been erased. Uh, and I think especially his work on international politics is something that he, we have chosen to forget. Uh, and I think this is reflected in the way that much of his legacy uh, outside of the UN, U.S. It, it remains uh, relatively neglected. In the U.S., within specific fields, uh, Africana studies, of course, increasingly disciplines like sociology have started to recognize the contribution that he made to those fields. But oftentimes we remember Du Bois very much as a caricature. People have heard of the concepts of the town to 10th, or they've heard of the color line, uh, and they tend to assume that that's all that Du Bois did. But Du Bois, you know, had an extraordinarily long intellectual career. He started writing uh, in 1899, and he continued to publish all the way through his death in 1963. So his intellectual legacy is almost 60 plus years, and it covers an extraordinary wide swath of different types of writing, books, but he also wrote pamphlets, he wrote newspaper articles, and not just for uh, the United States, he often wrote for periodicals around the world. He was a contributor to newspapers in India, in Africa, in the Middle East. Right? Uh, and so it is hard uh, to both recognize him as one of our most celebrated American intellectuals, but also to recognize the extraordinary importance uh, that he has for people around the world. Um, here are some of the, this is his office, actually. I, I took this picture because it's really quite disturbing, uh, the state that it's in. Everything is sort of in uh, deteriorating, right? It's, it's not climate controlled. These are some of his personal books. Um, you can literally walk into this private office of his uh, that's part of the, the center. And you could, if you wanted to, just take the books off the shelf. Because they're just sitting out in the open, deteriorating in, in the Canadian heat. Now, there are plans to actually build a, new center, but they don't have the funding. And so currently this is all kind of in limbo. Uh, and it's quite tragic when you go because you know you would think that this is a, a major pilgrimage site in Accra, uh, but it is completely neglected by the Ghanaian government. And I would suggest by the larger international community as well. So there are, I think, important efforts currently uh, being made to, to, to resolve this and, and to provide them with the appropriate uh, treatment that they that they deserve. I mean, many of these books actually have extensive notifications in, in, in the columns written by Du Bois himself. Right? Um, so it's quite sad to see the, the current state of, of disrepair. All right, so for those of you who are not that familiar with Du Bois, I, one of the key arguments that I make in this essay and is part of this larger project that I'm working on uh, is that it is a fool's errand to try to separate out Du Bois both from larger political debates that are unfolding within the United States during his lifetime, uh, as well as from some of the broader global dynamics that are unfolding during his, during his life. There's a way in which we tend to box Du Bois into you know, Black History Month as we are currently, uh, within the disciplines of Africana studies, maybe sociology, but we fail to treat him 
sort of polymathic intellectual who had major contributions to all sorts of debates, and especially within the field of international relations specifically. And one of the things I want, want to do with this slide, uh, which I just put together today, but I think is, is useful, is to show how much of his life actually intersected with these seminal moments across the 20th century. Uh, so a few things here I just want to point out. Right? Uh, first, Du Bois' life uh, almost completely overlaps with the American period of Jim Crow. He was born just a few years after the end of the Civil War, and so his early childhood uh, was characterized by the rise of Jim Crow, uh, failure of Reconstruction, which becomes one of his major themes uh, in, in most of his work during the, during the early period of his, of his time. But there are a couple other moments, I think, in American history. So obviously, everybody knows Du Bois as a great scholar of Reconstruction and Jim Crow. Uh, but there are other things that Du Bois also was heavily influenced that are going on during this period, most centrally, the rise of the United States as a global empire. And here, there are a couple key moments that I think shape uh, the young Du Bois right, and create this uh, intellectual project where he's trying to, to interpret what's unfolding within the United States around Black civil rights in particular, and connected to European imperialism globally. Right. Uh, so a couple of things, right, I want to point out. First, you know, the, the uh, end of the Civil War in the United States is often treated um, as kind of a distinct moment that then is followed by a process of reconciliation between the North and the South. One thing that most Americans don't really acknowledge is that the way that the United States dealt uh, with the Civil War is to offer a full amnesty to Confederate soldiers, incorporate them into the Union Army, and then send them out west uh, to pacify uh, Native Americans along the U.S.-Mexican border. Right. Uh, so this was a period of American expansion, um, and this is a period that really shapes uh, Du Bois' young, uh, young intellectual life. It is a period in which the United States is starting to expand its domestic empire. And alongside its efforts to pacify the West, or the Southwest in particular, uh, the US is increasingly debating whether the United States should acquire colonies in the fashion of its European environment. Most people know that the 19th century was a period uh, where the US is coming out of its isolationist period. And so there is starting to be a debate within intellectual circles in the United States about whether the US should acquire uh, a global empire. And this sort of comes to a head by the late 19th century during the Spanish-American War. It was a very short war that takes place in 1898 uh, in which the United States won and led to the annexation of Hawaii, the Philippines, and Guam. And some people know that the U.S. had a colony in the Philippines. Of course, Hawaii is now part of the United States. But this is happening <clears throat> during uh, Du Bois's time at Harvard. Uh, he had gone to Harvard by the late 1890s to to get his PhD, uh, and you can start to see that he's very influenced by these debates that are unfolding uh, around the question of American empire. Uh, and these are not subtle debates, these are unfolding uh, in the main publications of the time. I'll talk more about, about what's happening, right, uh, in terms of the emergence of the field of international relations, because this is also a period uh, in which the discipline of international relations starts to emerge. Okay? Um, and you know, throughout here, you can see there are these interesting parallels. So all of the things on the left are, are kind of key uh, moments in Du Bois's life, and you can kind of see what's going on globally at the same time. And my point here, which is very obvious if you read his writing, especially if you read his writing uh, in places like foreign affairs, which I'll talk about, uh, that he's also deeply influenced by this, that he's trying to produce the synthesis that connects what's happening in the United States around race to what's happening in the colonies against European colonialism. Uh, and he's deeply influenced by world events, things like the Russian Revolution, the two world wars, the founding of the United Nations. So he was actually at the Dumbarton Oaks Conference in 1945 in San Francisco, where the United Nations was created. He was actually there for the, I think, two months uh, as, a, as a representative. Right? Um, it's just really fascinating, it kind of overlaps between these two, these two historical moments. Right? Again, histories that we tend to treat separately, but I think within the body of this one man, um, are, are unfolding simultaneously. And I'll try to show you, uh, you know, some of the ways in which this influences his thought during this period. Okay, let me just take a, a brief diversion here to talk about the origins of international relations. Uh, most of you are in a, in, a, in, a, in a program related to the study of international relations. This is something that, you know, historically has evolved 
Um, you know, in recent times, the, the version of it that emerged in the United States is different than, say, what emerged in the UK uh, roughly at the same period. Um, but it really starts to take hold in the early 20th century. Right? And the first kind of major journal uh, for the dedicated to the study of international relations at the time was called the Journal of Race Development. Now, this may seem a little peculiar in terms of how we think about the field of international relations today, where the subject of race is almost never uh, commented on until fairly recently when we've had these revisionist attempts to reintroduce the subject of race into the study of IR. Uh, but its origins were very much within racial discourses. Of the, the Journal of Race Development was uh, founded um, by a man named George Blakesley, right? and in the first issue, uh, the first edition of the Journal of Race Development, uh, he laid out the, the fundamental mission uh, of the journal, which was to be the premier forum for the discussion of the problems which relate to the progress of races in states generally considered backward. Right? This could be considered the founding statement of the field of international relations in the United States. And efforts to recover this history of, of race uh, and its centrality to the study of IR in the United States. Uh, perhaps one of the more prominent figures have written about this is Bob Vitalis, who is a professor at uh, UPenn. Um, and he encapsulates it, I think, quite neatly in this, in this statement where he says that the central challenge is defining the new field of imperial relations. Right? Again, remember, this is a period that is prior to the rise of the nation state, it is a world of empires, uh, with the US as kind of a, an emerging power uh, within this larger contest for control of global territory. So the field itself was often referred to as imperial relations, not international relations, because it was a world of empires, right? not of nation states. Um, so the central challenge to find the new field of imperial relations was the efficient political administration and race development of subject peoples. Um, okay. Here you can see the cover of this uh, journal. This is, I think, uh, volume one. It's probably too small to, to notice from there, uh, but if you look at the list of contributing editors uh, right there, you can see Professor W.E.B. Du Bois, Atlanta University. Uh, so Du Bois was involved with this project literally since its founding, and he was somebody, especially at this point in his intellectual uh, career, uh, who was deeply committed to the study of race uh, and its development and evolution globally. It was very much in the camp uh, uh, of race studies, right? Indeed, when the Journal of Race Development eventually folded and turned into a different journal, uh, Du Bois wrote to the editor at the time to protest the name change, right? He said that you should not take the study, the, the, the term race out of the study of international relations, right? Because they are the same. There is no distinction between them. Um, and so he never published in the successor journal, right? Uh, here you can see one of his early uh, pieces for this journal. It's called the, Of the Culture of White Folk. Right? Uh, and Du Bois, you know, did not write as an American. He viewed himself as part of the darker peoples of the world. Um, that's essentially the role that he played. You can tell from the names over here, there weren't a lot of people of color uh, who participated in these debates. Du Bois was perhaps the only one who was regularly allowed to contribute to the journal and served as a contributing editor. Uh, and he wrote a lot about what it meant for black and brown people, darker peoples from around the world, uh, to try to make sense of what he considered the Euro-American problem. Uh, very much uh, uh, an understanding of international relations that put racism and imperialism at its center. And he wasn't some you know, uh, uh, crazy figure on the margins of the discipline. His work was taken very seriously during this period. Uh, there are really extraordinary debates that unfold in this journal, right? There are questions, entire articles. I went through a lot of the archives uh, at the time, and there are articles about, you know, are blonde people able to live in the tropics, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are the kind of articles that were being written. And Du Bois was, a, was an active participant in the debates of the time. Um, and very much standing of race and international. So what were some of the takeaways of, from Du Bois uh, during this period? Here, I just want to provide some quotes, I think, that illustrate kind of where his mind was uh, in terms of how he was trying to think about some of this stuff. And importantly, I think, uh, how he was ahead uh, of the times in terms of his understanding uh, of the relationship between race and international relations, class, um, 
Yeah, I'll say more about this in a minute. But as you can see, right, early on, uh, Du Bois is very heavily influenced uh, by Marxist thought. Nowadays, we talk a lot about the, the rise of kind of a, a black Marxist tradition. Uh, and again, Du Bois is often left out uh, of that lineage, but Du Bois was very much influenced uh, by Marxist thinkers of the time. He was quite influenced by the Russian Revolution that occurred in 1917. Uh, and he was sort of pointing his way uh, to try to make sense of the intersections between race and class. Long before uh, the term racial capitalism kind of came into vogue as it is currently, uh, Du Bois was clearly showing uh, a, a constructivist understanding a race that was very different than the kind of biological essentialism that dominated uh, the study of race during this period. Right? If you read uh, articles that are being written during this period, the voices understanding of how race and class intersect uh, was remarkably uh, different uh, than the kind of biological essentialism that largely characterized the social scientific debates of, the, of this period. Um, for those who are not familiar with the history of race in the United States, um, you know, race was thought to be uh, an immutable biological characteristic uh, that divided people along a clear hierarchy. Uh, and there was nothing that could be done to overcome the limitations of your genetics, right? Obviously, we, we know that there are uh, lineages of this tradition today, but at the time, this was a, a very radical argument. Argued uh, that, that race was actually a tool that elites used uh, to produce a labor class. Here you can see his in, the influence uh, of, of Marxist traditions, uh, as well as kind of his unique contribution in terms of theorizing how race and class intersect in, in the needs of, of, of the elite class for pool of cheap labor. Right? This was something that was consistent across his writing. Again, uh, Du Bois is often caricatured by some of his early work uh, around ideas of the talent of 10, uh, where he argues you know, that, uh, that you need an elite class of African-Americans to pull up the entire race. But he largely had rejected most of those views by the 1920s. Right? By the 1920s, he'd already pushed back against that uh, and moved towards more of a Marxist analysis in terms of his understanding of race. And, and throughout the rest of his career, which again, decades long, um, uh, he's moving uh, in that direction right? to try to theorize how do race and class intersect. Uh, this is a title of the, the piece that uh, I took this quote from, and this was one of five articles that Du Bois published in, in Foreign Affairs. So Foreign Affairs, which is still in publication today and can be considered uh, you know, the, the premier publication for the mainstream of international relations in the United States uh, and potentially around the world, uh, emerges in, in, uh, after World War I. Right? It quickly sets itself as its agenda. Uh, as being kind of the, the premier space for debates around international relations in the US. Uh, and from its dawn, really, they brought Du Bois in as a, as, a, as, a, as a regular contributor. So between 1918 and 1943, Du Bois actually contributed five original essays uh, to foreign affairs. This was one of them that he wrote in 1935 uh, on Ethiopia. Basically, anything that's written during this period around Africa, around Asia, it's, it's usually got Du Bois's fingerprints <clears throat> on it. He was a very influential figure, very unique right, for an African-American figure uh, at that time to achieve that kind of stature within the field of international relations in particular, which to, even today uh, is not as diverse as it probably should be. Um, here is just a, obviously Du Bois's most famous work is called Black Reconstruction. People often tend to separate out the work that Du Bois did uh, on domestic race relations, but I just wanted to show kind of the similarity in terms of how uh, Du Bois is, is theorizing the way in which race and class is working, both domestically and internationally. Right? Um, famous insights uh, in this work uh, is what he referred to as the public and psychological wage of whiteness. The kind of orienting question that he takes up in Black Reconstruction is the question of why it is so difficult to get unity amongst the black and white working class, right? From a purely Marxist perspective, to go back to an earlier point, uh, you know, the, there should be a natural basis of solidarity uh, between the working classes, regardless of race. And this Marxist slogan, uh, workers of the world unite, right? Sort of speaks to this assumption, material similarities between working class peoples around the world forms an obvious basis for unity which of course did not apply to the US context where white workers in particular were often at the front lines 
of enforcing America's system of segregation. And, and so Du Bois was very troubled by this. He spent a lot of his time trying to make sense uh, why it is that from a material perspective, which is at the core of Marxist theorizing, uh, white workers were working against their own interests by supporting the white ruling class. And what he theorized in Black Reconstruction is that white elites provided a public and psychological wage to white workers, wherein they would provide them uh, with some benefits, right? Finding coverage in the media, complimentary statements from elite politicians, uh, privileged positions within the policing force, segregated neighborhoods, all things that didn't require the white elite to actually make any material sacrifices in the interest of white class. And for Du Bois, and this is the key point I want to remember, right, these psychological wages, as you refer to them, could actually overcome the material disadvantages that the white working class faced vis-a-vis -vis the white ruling class. Because it suggests that material factors can be overcome by ideological and cultural forces. Okay. So one of the most famous things that Du Bois uh, uh, wrote about in, in the Souls of Black Folk was the idea of the color line. Right? Uh, I think most of you are familiar with this idea, but the, the notion that, that race is the central dividing line of American social, political, and economic life. Uh, one of the things that was very consistent for Du Bois all along is that the color line itself was global. We mostly hear about the idea of the color line in the American context, but from its early iteration uh, throughout his, his life, really, uh, Du Bois insisted on the idea that it was never simply a domestic reality. It was always, in fact, a global. Right? So he referred to this international color line, uh, and he applied it to his studies of life in African colonies in particular. Uh, so here he's talking about uh, the American colony of Liberia, which is a country in West Africa. Um, and he was actually sent at the time on behalf of the State Department, right? again, reflecting the stature as the, as the premier Black intellectual in the United States, to go study a, a plan by the Firestone Corporation, which controlled Liberia at the time, uh, on behalf of the U.S. State Department. And he wrote this report for foreign affairs. This was also published in foreign affairs. Uh, where he offers a, a really scathing critique uh, about the, the exploitation uh, that he perceived on his visit to Liberia. Uh, and it's a really interesting quote because there's a couple of different things that are going on here. Obviously, you know, the, the, the extension of this global color line and its application to the case of Liberia is really interesting, but there's also an extended critique of the Liberian elite during this period and the role that the Liberian elite had played uh, in allowing the Firestone Corporation and the US government to exploit ordinary Liberians. Uh, and so as early as the 1930s, Du Bois was developing a critique that gets picked up later on by figures like Franz Fanon, Neil Cabral, uh, about the, what we might call the challenges of the, the post-colonial post elite uh, and the risks of a presumed solidarity on the basis of skin color or national identity. Okay. See, this is another piece that he published in Foreign Affairs at the time. I think you can see here, you know, wide ranging capacity that he had uh, to analyze international politics. Really quite extraordinary. So he wrote this piece called Worlds of Color. This was an important piece because it was written uh, on the 25th anniversary, or the 20th anniversary of, uh, of the Souls of Black Folks. So Foreign Affairs actually asked him to revisit the concept of the color line to see whether or not uh, his statement around the color line had continue to be relevant, right? So he wrote a piece called Worlds of Color, uh, where he sort of explored the question of the color line 20 years after he had coined the concept. Right? And in it, he has this very interesting kind of observation that I think is quite influential for my own work now, where I'm looking at popular movements, uh, and trying to understand this question of how race, class, and democracy intersect. And what Du Bois is writing about here uh, is the ways in which colonialism, right, so the possession of colonies abroad um, will necessarily impact the uh, uh, reality of democracy. And again, I think this is a, a very important point. If you study international relations, even today, right, uh, the field of international relations is carved out from the field of American politics. There is, uh, until fairly recently within the discipline of political science, uh, an assumption 
that these were two separate domains of study. Right? On one side, you could study domestic politics, in which you'd be considered an Americanist. On the other side, you would be somebody interested in international systems, in which case you'd be hierarchist. Uh, and the basic assumption that, that guided this division, which is still quite strong even today, uh, is that the domestic and the international can be kept separate. That you can study American politics uh, in isolation from American foreign policy. I think what this quote shows is that as early as 1925, uh, Du Bois was questioning this division. Can you be a democracy that holds colonies abroad? Or will the holding of colonies abroad necessarily affect the quality of democracy? And here, I think the body states very clearly uh, that there's no way a democracy can also be in uh, Which, you know, when you think about it, it seems obvious. <laughs> but uh, at the time, and I think until fairly recently, even in the United States, uh, there was a huge reluctance to thinking of the United States as an empire. The idea was that how could we be an empire uh, if we are a democracy? Uh, and I think showing you and again i don't i don't think one thing i want to emphasize right, uh, is that du bois is is very much engaged in a, in a counter discourse so a lot of what he's thinking about is not uh, uh completely um you know uh, uh, completely original thoughts these are things that are being said very openly by figures like marcus garvey right, who we disagreed with in a lot of levels figures like ralph bunch later on people were writing and saying these things within the black radical tradition openly but they did not penetrate the mainstream IR discourse, which preferred to hold on to this idea uh, that there was this fundamental difference between you know, uh, being a democrat democracy at home and engaging in colonial practices abroad. Right? That, that, that distinction could be sustained. And what Du Bois is doing here is taking from these much more radical spaces, both Marxist thought as well as Black radical thought, uh, and putting it into words that were accessible to the mainstream uh, foreign affairs. In, in fight, um, he, he didn't mince his words. It's quite straightforward about about his views around this. I think it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. As I mentioned earlier, Du Bois actually attended uh, uh, the Dumbarton Oaks uh, conference in San Francisco, which was where the United Nations was was uh, created. Right? Uh, by this point, Du Bois had emerged not only as a champion of civil rights in the United States, as a, as a champion of anti-colonial struggles across Africa and Asia, uh, but also as a leading uh, global peace actor and an anti-nuclear actor. So uh, as early as 1943, uh, Du Bois was investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigations for distributing anti-war pamphlets. He was quite a prominent figure Again, you know, the erasure of Du Bois uh, amongst the American left is a, is a real tragedy, right? Um, but he was somebody who was investigated uh, by the U.S. government for his, his perceived sympathies uh, to communists as early as the 1940s. He was also a major, a ma major victim uh, of domestic McCarthyism that, that begins to take hold after World War II, right? Uh, but at least until this period, he was still considered a member in good standing uh, within, within the larger foreign affairs community in the United States. That began to change in 1943 with the FBI's investigation. Right? Once Du Bois started to be assumed, started to be investigated uh, on the assumption that he had sympathies to the Communist Party, uh, he started to be frozen out by the mainstream IR community. Right? So think about this. He first starts to publish in foreign affairs in 1919. And he continues to publish in foreign affairs until 1943. He was a, a major figure in the international relations foreign policy community in the United States for, for several decades. And in 1943, when um, he's already in his, in his 70s, uh, because of these investigations into uh, his perceived communist sympathies, right, which actually had nothing to do with him saying anything pro-communist. Uh, he was just an anti-war activist um, at this point, let me be clear. Uh, he gets shut out by the foreign affairs or the foreign policy community more broadly, right? And so this is a pitch. These words are, uh, uh, are from a letter he wrote uh, to Hamilton Fish, who was a longtime editor of foreign affairs. Uh, and I was able to see the archives uh, that, uh, that include these letters between Du Bois and, and the editors of foreign affairs, where he said, look, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm gonna be there for two months. And would you like me to write a report uh, about the founding of this major international body from the perspective of you know, what we now refer to as the global south. Uh, and they rejected. 
uh, and Du Bois would never publish in foreign affairs. Which is really extraordinary because, again, as I mentioned earlier, he goes on to write for another 20 years. So it's not like he was so old that he was not producing. He continued to produce, he continued to write about international affairs. But it's really uh, not because he's a Black American that he gets shut out of the foreign policy establishment, though that certainly will play a role. Uh, it's because of his perceived communist. And this only accelerates in the period. As I mentioned at the opening, uh, soon after Du Bois has his passport rescinded for the first time, uh, this prevents him from taking a number of trips that he had planned. He eventually ends up penniless uh, because the predominant source of his income uh, in the 1940s and 1950s uh, was money that he got from speaker's fees, and he was no longer able to travel to collect those kind of uh, fees. He was shunned not only by the foreign policy establishment, uh, but also by many figures within the civil rights movement as well, uh, including figures like Ralph Bunch, um, who I have a piece coming up out about in foreign affairs actually soon enough. Um, but Ralph Bunch at the time was was rising through the United Nations ranks, uh, or starting to kind of you know be a key figure, uh, eventually going on to become the, the highest ranking American in the United Nations. Uh, and he too, despite the fact that he worshipped Du Bois as a, as a teenager. Uh, starts to distance himself from Du Bois. Other figures in the domestic civil rights movement similarly start to push away from Du Bois. And so that by the late 1940s and 1950s, uh, du, Bois has, du Bois has been largely marginalized by the foreign policy establishment, by academia, and by key figures in the civil rights struggle as well. Uh, which I think helps explain why he ended up accepting the invitation to go to Ghana uh, once he has the capacity to do so. Uh, he actually tried to go to Ghana uh, in 1957. Uh, he was invited by Nkrumah uh, to attend the independence celebrations when Ghana became independent in 1957, uh, and he was denied. Uh, he actually wrote a, a personal letter to Richard Nixon, who, uh, you know, who was the vice president at the time and who actually attended uh, Kwame Nkrumah's inauguration in 1957 on behalf of the United States. And Du Bois tried to lobby to get his passport reinstated so he could attend. This is after eight years of not being allowed to travel internationally. Um, and Nixon ignored him and eventually, after his death, demonized him uh, for being a, a communist. And Nixon instead, himself instead went on behalf of the United States. All right, how are we doing time? You're good? Yeah. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say a few words. I, I have a lot more to say about my own work on this, but I, I just wanna sort of try to draw some parallels between what I, what I like about reading figures like Du Bois, uh, and there's a whole long list of other folks who I'm trying to engage with as part of this project, because I think there's something to be said about what Du Bois's vantage point provides us for, for, for making sense uh, of our current moment. Right? Um, you know, I think that the exclusion of black and brown political intellectuals, activists, thinkers around the global uh, has been to the detriment uh, of the field of international relations overall. Uh, because I think you know the the field of IR uh, likes to hide behind kind of a, a, a pseudo scientism, right? the idea uh, that they're discovering some sort of laws uh, of global order, and I'm open to that possibility. Uh, but I think it starts to fall apart in, in what I would refer to as, as disruptive moments. Uh, and so I've been looking, you know, kind of at these sort of historical moments. I'll move through this. This was some of my first book looking at 1940s and 1950s, right, periods where you have these sort of fundamental reorderings of the global order. Um, you know, these are things that catch academics and, and international relations scholars in particular completely off guard. What do you do when the entire system of empires that has defined the world uh, for several centuries by this point starts to collapse, collapse rapidly? Between 1947, when India gets independence in 1963, most of the world goes from being under the domination European empires, uh, and most IR scholars at the time, if you read that literature, had no, they did not believe it. Some of them would talk about maybe India would be free in 99 years. They did not see it happening within a year or two after the end. And they did not see all of Africa, which they thought was centuries away from it, um, ever achieving this kind of rapid pace of decolonization that actually unfolds. Uh, so this is a picture of Nkrumah uh, from that time period. If you look at the 80s and 90s, we see a similar kind of uh, period of disruption, right? That was also accompanied by these wide-scale protests. But what, what is 
I think important about a lot of these uh, moments is that there, you know, there's these things going on at the international level, but they also play out in a way that Du Bois had kind of anticipated within the domestic context. Right? So these sort of major transformations of the international order uh, are not happening separately than what's happening domestically, but they're, they're uh, mutually reinforced. And that I think is a hugely important lesson. And what I'm trying to do with this project is to try to understand this current wave of, of disruption that we're living through today. Right? So since 2005, we've been able to document very clearly a massive rise in popular uprisings around the world. Uh, lots of governments, you could name the country and, and you could think of the protests that had unfolded. Here is just the African context. You can see as recently as 2019, the number of countries that have been affected by these sort of disruptive protests. Um, you know, this is again, global phenomenon. So like the 1940s and 50s, when you have these huge uprisings all these 90s, similarly with the fall of the Soviet Union, you had a similar kind of outburst of protest. It appears that we are again living through a period of tremendous domestic disruption, which my argument here is, is being fueled by transformations at the global level. Right? Um, I'll go into the details here, but part of this is very much influenced by kind of Du Bois' attempts to connect the economic with the political. Right? And so his attempts to try to understand how a shifting global economic order produces a shifting domestic political order is hugely influential for, for what I'm trying to do with this project. Um, I was going to walk you through some of the arguments that these two So let me just end by sort of talking about um, so some of the protests that I've been studying. Right? Uh, I think have these interesting echoes uh, uh, with these earlier periods. Right. So uh, I don't know about that. Okay. These are some protests that unfolded in 2012 in, uh, in, in southern Tanzania, in Dea, uh, which I visited soon after the, the, the protests had been crushed by the national government. And so a big part of my argument here, my interest here is what does the rise of Asia and China in particular mean for the global order? Uh, the gist of it is that most scholars who study social movements tend to focus on domestic level factors, right? To the exclusion of international. What I'm trying to do here is to insert uh, into the debate, how changes at the global level are actually producing these protests at the domestic level. Right? So these are pictures of a protest that I took that unfolded around the creation of a Chinese pipeline off the coast of Tanzania uh, to pump gas from southern Tanzania to Dar es Salaam, which is the economic capital. Right? Uh, and the, uh, you know, protested this because the pipeline would completely bypass this rural part of the country, which was the center. Um, uh, uh, of all kinds of you know historical moments and has always been neglected. Right? Uh, and the response of the government was to crush the protest. Here is a quote from the president at the time uh, where he demonizes the protesters for demanding some share of this massive gas pipeline, right? the revenues that it was going to produce. And to me, you know, I think it captures a, the kind of arrogance and the disconnect that Du Bois was warning, warning about uh, when he's writing about Nigeria in the 1930s. Ways in which these national level elites, you know, Africa has been growing at a tremendous pace, almost all due to foreign direct investment coming in from China. Right? But most of this foreign direct investment that is coming in is being captured by very narrow elites within African countries. So in the 90s, Africa was one, one of the poorest, but also one of the most equal countries. Uh, the countries of Africa were the most equal in the world, you know, relatively poor, but relatively equal, similar to places like India, which in the 80s and 90s was relatively poor and relatively equal. Now, ten of the most unequal seven of the ten most unequal countries in the world are on the African continent. And this includes rich countries like South Africa and Botswana, but also desperately poor countries like South, Central African Republic. So, what is fueling this? Right? We know that the protests have something to do with this massive spike in inequality, but where is that coming? A large part of it is who is capturing all of the the, the, the investment that is coming in from Asia. It's not trickling down. It's being captured by very narrow. Um, you can see this in other countries like the Democratic Congo. Uh, you know, Congo is hugely important to, to the question of a green economy. Many of the uh, resources that will fuel the rise of a, of a green economy are mined in places like Congo. Congo is a country that is the size of Western Europe, one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, but again, also producing a, a very narrow elite at the very top of this larger system of exploitation, fueling these kind of protest movements by the government. 
what I really like about the Congolese movement that I'm studying is, is the way in which the activists themselves have been framing what they're doing. And I think there are echoes of what Du Bois was, was trying to, to get at. Um, you know, so one of the things that, that I think is important here uh, is a critique of this assumption that people only protest around material conditions, right? That the only reason people go out into the streets is because they can't afford food or they can't afford bread. Um, you know, there are terms for this, fuel protests, fuel riots, bread riots, bread protests, that seem to center um, this pretty economistic account for why people might take to the streets. And over and over, you see with the Congolese protesters, uh, that they're talking about something more about the question of human dignity. UNESCO refers to the, the UN peacekeepers. One of the really interesting things about these protests in Congo is that they've been targeting UN peacekeepers. Right? And the UN keeps asking the question of why are they targeting us? They must be naive or ignorant. They don't know we're here to help. Right? And you can actually just read the words of the protesters uh, who are very clear that we don't want the UN involved. We think that they are contributing uh, to our military. They're not here to help. I think that echoes again uh, Du Bois's critique of the liberal international order and the ways in which you can produce uh, these really problematic dynamics. Lastly, just some slides from here, I think, about uh, the protests that unfolded in Sudan in 2019 that are continuing today. Of course, it led to the fall of the government in 2019. But you're starting to see these uh, protesters engaging in really interesting campaigns. So if you look here at the bottom right picture, they set up this encampment. Um, these are protesters from Darfur. And these are usually darker skinned, racially distinct peoples from Darfur, uh, really on the periphery of the country. And so one of the things that they did was to set up camp within the main protest site in Khartoum uh, to educate people in Khartoum who were completely oblivious to what was happening in Darfur about the conditions that were there. And I think, again, here you can see, you know, to go back to, to Du Bois's comment about how race Sudan is actually very strangely similar to the United States in that it has been ruled by this narrow Arabized elite uh, since its independence. And people in Khartoum are completely oblivious uh, to what's happening in the rest of the country. Right? So part of what the Darfur activists have been doing as part of this last, larger national mobilization uh, is trying to educate normal Sudanese, right, Arabized Sudanese, uh, on the interconnections between their struggles. You can't live in Khartoum and be totally disconnected. And they've been successful. Um, so I think there's a number of very important lessons, and I'll finish on this. Um, you know, obviously the question of how race and class are co-constituted, I think, is hugely important. Right? There's a whole world of international political economy uh, within the larger discipline of IR. But race, as I mentioned, I think it remains largely uh, a tertiary concern at best. Right? That's just a site for kind of critical revisionist scholarship. Um, but I think you know it's a, a real problem. To assume that you can uh, uh, exclude the question of race from the question of international political economy or field of international relations more generally. I think Du Bois offered us a way to talk about the ways in which these are co-constituted. I think, you know, again, there's a lot of very good work coming out by historians and political scientists now uh, that are looking at all of the different ways that the U.S. has operated as an empire since at least the late 19th century, right? um, late 20, late, yeah, late 19th century. Um, you know, but I think, you know, Du Bois was on this beat way before, um, you know, figures like Daniel Reschlaus and others have written really interesting books uh, on the United States as an empire. If you want to give credit where credit is due, we should trace those critiques of the U.S. as an empire back to Du Bois, but there's a resistance to uh, centering him in his discourse. This question of the relationship between domestic and international Right. Increasingly, IR and political science more generally are recognizing how these things are, are mutually constituted and mutually reinforcing. Uh, but Du Bois was again way ahead of this. Right? And again, the, the, the extraordinary uh, problem with the erasure of Du Bois is that he was not writing this in the crisis, right? which was the NAACP's newsletter. He wasn't writing this in the New Amsterdam News, which is Harlem. He was writing this in Foreign Affairs, which was the mainstream journal of the foreign policy establishment. And so for contemporary IR scholars to continue to exclude him, right, to continue to fail to credit him, insights and observations is scandalous. Um, and I hope that we're in a moment or a period uh, where we're starting to come to terms with that. Um, this goes to my specific concern with the study of protests, right? Uh, the centrality of human dignity beyond the material, 
damn political science. We tend to be very rationalist in our, in our, our, in our studies of, of social movements in particular. We tend to attribute a lot to the material domain. And I think, again, this was a question, uh, as I showed you, with the, the psychological ways of whiteness uh, that Du Bois was pondering back in the 1930s. Right? Emphasize the importance of these uh, non material factors uh, in shaping human behavior. And finally, this idea uh, of how do we build a, a, a coalition for change? Right? Uh, there's a way in which you know, my other field of Black studies in the United States has become increasingly parochial, uh, focus more on domestic race relations. I think this is very contrary uh, to, the, to the legacy that Du Bois was, was trying to carve out. And, really the larger black radical tradition, uh, which has always been internationalist to the core. Right? Um, I think there's a, a, a lot of value in revisiting uh, the ways in which this generation of scholars or activists and thinkers uh, really emphasize. You know, again, when you think about it, you know, we're told this story that we move into a world of shifting borders and uh, you know, that information travels around the world at the speed of light. Um, and what's really extraordinary to me about figures like Du Bois and figures like Ambedkar in India, who actually were in communication with each other as early as the 1920s, is how robust international correspondences they had. You can go and see letters that Du Bois wrote to Indian independence figures, to Vietnamese activists, of course, to a whole range of African uh, political activists around the world, going back to the early 1900s. And you can read articles that he wrote for newspapers in Africa and Asia and the Middle East um, that are really extraordinary because he's a close follower and observer of these struggles. Right? Um, and I think, you know, we need to get back to that, right? uh, a kind of more internationalist perspective that, that Du Bois was able to carve out uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and if he could do it you know, back then, I suspect that we could continue to do it today. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Much. I'm just going to uh, um, so uh, I'm going to start off with a question, and hopefully that will give some time for the for the audience to come up with some as well. Um, this division between the domestic and the international um, is often presented, you know, academically as an ontological and epistemological division, right? It just makes sense. Cellular biology is different than astrophysics because of the, the subject matter, but as you say. Du Bois is saying, well, this is, this is not true. But we, we see, for example, Martin White writing in the 1950s saying um, that this inside-outside division is, is important. Um, don't, judge a, don't judge international morality on the same basis as you would domestic morality. There's a kind of underlying racial issue there that we can treat people outside of international society the way they need to be treated you know, as barbarians. But that's not necessarily how we would act at home. Do you think this division, and does Du Bois come out and say it as much, that this division is actually a strategic division as opposed to a academic myopic division of we have just got this kind of, the fields are mixed up? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it gets to you know, uh, a concept uh, of sort of a double consciousness. Yeah. That was very central to Du Bois and this idea um, that you could you know, really uh, use, use the word ontological, uh, exist within two different ontologies. I think a lot of how uh, du Bois' uh, move through the world reflected that kind of double consciousness, right? But uh, there was no contradiction for him uh, in being both an African and an American. You know, he was a regular participant in the Pan Africanist Congresses. He, he organized the first Pan Africanist Congress, uh, attended you know, multiple versions of them, also participated in uh, you know, things like uh, um, to the Bendon Conference, right? Mm -hmm. So the League Against Imperialism, which was a conference held in 1919. Um, you know, he, he really thought of himself as occupying these multiple sites, mm -hmm. right? And I think that notion of double consciousness is not so unfamiliar uh, to people who are part of diasporas or, or, or you know, uh, immigrants who, who retain strong ties to, to multiple countries where, you know, it's actually a pretty common phenomenon. It's actually the unique and exceptional position to be like, well, I've left that world behind. Mm -hmm. I don't care what happens in my homeland. Mm -hmm. I don't care about these people who look like me who mm -hmm. continue to be exploited uh, because now I'm on this side of the earth. Right. Um, and I think that 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 is, you know, perhaps for I, I don't know the figure you mentioned, um, but for him, maybe he could just say, well, now I'm this and I don't care about yeah. what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. right? But I don't think that was possible for him. So 
and for Du Bois, uh, when he you know, saw the struggle of the people in Africa and Asia, he really felt that it as his struggle. Right? And for him, that that experience was, was, was really essential to everything that he, that he did. We see this with figures like Ralph Bunch as well. Right? And Bunch it kind of has to make a choice. Right. Uh, and Bunch actually chooses to say, you know what, I'm going to cut off yeah. my, my attachment to Africa and to the colonized people, which he had been working on for decades, right? because I need to do this in order to be. Mm. And that to me is a tragic way, uh, a tragic nationalist thought. Yeah. Uh, this idea that you have to choose and you can't be both simultaneously. Yeah, I, I, I would love to get into a conversation about the whole acceptability and kind of respectability politics that goes along with that, that, that bunch, you know, Ralph, or, you know, Urquhart says, to, says of him, he's the least obvious person I've ever met. And I think Du Bois would, in some senses, be accused of being an obvious person yeah. in the same way that, that Bunch perhaps had chosen not to be. Um, questions in the room? Professor Sidhu. Oh, and somebody else. Oh, you're the only hand up so far. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating and, uh, you know, uh, brilliant. And it just opens up so many vistas that I want to sort of explore. So I'm going to try and confine myself here a little bit as well. Um, one is, you know, the Marxist kind of uh, drivers of Du Bois, uh, absolutely kind of valid. And you can see how that would be attractive because even within, uh, but also problematic because even within Marxism, there was this big debate whether, you know, if you like the Stalin Trotsky debate, whether you wanted to be entirely domestic first or you wanted the great internationalist to sort of go forward as well. Then you have M.N. Roy in that mix as well, right? Uh, sort of going on. But in this context, uh, you, you have an alternative decolonized uh, approach and perspective. That's the Gandhian one. Uh, broadly the Indian one, but essentially influenced by Gandhi. There's absolute antithesis to communism, Marxism, right? Uh, which essentially sort of talks about the violent overthrow of the order. Whereas here, it was a great effort to sort of not violently overthrow the order, although there was violence. Involved. So I think in some ways, that sort of context, and, and I was struck by that because in that very good chart that you have is of the parallel of his life and, you know, global developments, there's an absence of India. Yeah. And there's the absence of what's broadly happening in Asia in that sense. They're not, you know, absolutely fine, but it's a minor quibble, right? <laughs> but, but also, I think it underlines a more fundamental thing, and this is the second element, which relates very much to the work that you're doing now as well. If you look at the process of decolonization globally, Marxist, violent, peaceful, non-violent, whatever, essentially, including South Africa, by the way, in 1994, it has been a transition of power from one set of elites to a local set of elites yeah. uh, at the cost of this more groundswell that you are very much now kind of focused on. And you can see that that is now, now happening as the elites become established uh, and it's comfortable enough to challenge them. You know, again, I can talk uh, on and for India a little bit. You look at, you know, who, ones who could have carried out the independence movement, the revolutions, all Western trained and educated. Today, that's not the case at all. A lot of them are, you know, kind of much more uh, domestically driven as well. So fascinating kind of area into, you know, so thank you uh, for building that. But the fundamental question that I'm raising, and I want to bring this into the IR uh, uh, realm as well, you're having an interesting debate at the moment, which is, and uh, absolutely no quibbles with you that, uh, IR, as we know it now, is Western, dominated largely by American scholarship. And, you know, and the linkage with nuclear weapons, nuclear power is absolutely fundamental. But that has led to a very interesting kind of debate going on as to the alternatives of that, right? So one of them is uh, people like Amitabhacharya, who kind of talk about the global or non-Western, but in some ways something else to replace the dominant discourse, except that it's not Western. Uh, but then you have people like uh, Randolph Persaud, who are essentially kind of again arguing and sort of saying, do we really, should we have a global or even Western or non-Western IR? Should there not be multiple IRs, right? And, and sort of this, uh, again, this kind of notion on, you know, uh, you have West failure. You've never had an East failure. 
or a South failure. But the more fundamental question is, do you really need one? Should there be one? And I think this is a very long-winded way of sort of saying, you know, where in this debate would you see yourself and your scholarship kind of falling? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. it's been very yeah. long-winded, yeah. but this uh, fascinating. As long as it ended the question mark, it's a question. Yeah, yeah. 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 What do you think? <laughs> A couple of things. You know, first, yeah, I, I think you. I only, I only didn't talk about India more just because I didn't have space on this. Well, not just India, but Asia. Yeah. But you know, you mentioned yeah. Bandung in passing, but yeah, yeah. So you have, you know, there, there are a couple of moments that I think are really important. That I would have put in the slide if I had more space. Yeah. Uh, the the Berlin Conference in 1884, founding of the Indian National Congress in 1885. Right. These are huge global historical moments that are happening simultaneously that are never really spoken of alongside the Apache War. Right. And to me, they, you know, this is all happening. So you have the Madhya's revolution in Sudan, you have the Apache Wars in the United States, you have the Berlin Conference, the founding of the International Conference. They're all happening simultaneously. Right? And Du Bois being the kind of incredible polymathic figure that he is, he is reading about everything. Right? He's, he's studying all of these things. He's following them with, with granular detail. Right? But the way that we've structured our, our disciplines is to say, okay, well, you want to learn about the Madhya's revolt in Sudan, you go to African studies, or you go to anthropology. Right. You want to study the Indian National Congress, you go to South Asian studies or history. If you want to study the Apache Wars, you go to American history. Right. And there's very little attempts to draw connections, even though these are happening within years of each other. And the intellect and these very overt connections between what's happening in these multiple locations simultaneously. And we do that to ourselves by, by adhering to these sort of interdisciplinary, I mean, these disciplinary traditions. Right. And so the question is, you know, what, how should we replace it? I like Amitabh Acharya's work very much, but I think the efforts to construct something called a non-Western IR is problematic because I come from a, a different school of thought that says, you know, people are always thinking in different ways. Right? So as an IR scholar or not is irrelevant to me, right? Because the figures that I was most enamored of, that I continue to be enamored of, many of them were not PhD. They were not teaching in, in social science departments. There are figures who, you know, like Franz Fanon, um, who to me is an IR theorist, right? I don't mean he was trained in international relations and published in IR journals. He doesn't have the same pedigree as a Du Bois, who had a PhD and published in foreign affairs. But if you want to understand international relations of that period, I'll take Franz Fanon any day, right? I'll take Walter Rodney any day. I'll take, I mean, there's so many of these figures. Uma, Nehru, I so mean, many yeah. And they were brilliant writers and they were deeply, I mean, you can't escape the international in their right? Because they never said, oh, I am an Indian you know, activist and I'm going to write about India. They are always theorizing the international. So when I want to construct a, a non-Western IR as it were, it would also be a non-disciplined. Um, and that reactionary kind of movement that has emerged in the United States and in the UK, especially, this whole attempt to decolonize IR because they're trying to create a new canon. Canon starts in 1990. Yeah. I'm like, well, what about Ekpal Ahmed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about Walter Rodney? What about all of these figures who were, to me, what I consider, I'm not, I don't care about the discipline of international I care about international politics. Um, and the sources of that, as you know very well, right, are, are, are multifaceted. And I, and I, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to read widely and to, to uncover these texts because they're they're there, um, like looking for Du Bois's writing in foreign affairs. I mean, you can find it on the internet. Right? It's on the archive. The fact that nobody had written a piece about Du Bois's foreign affairs writings is, is shocking, but it shows you the contempt, right? And people are not considered part of this canonical field uh, that we just tend to dismiss them out, right? And I think for people in Africa, for Asia, Latin America, if you are not, you know, there were, you know, if you're not participating in these disciplinary debates. We tend to say, okay, well, they're not doing IR, and that is ridiculous. Yeah. And it's only getting worse with the domination of quantitative methods. <laughs> that means if it doesn't have a calculus in it, it's not IR. Um, anybody online have a question? I'm not sure if Michelle is even still with us, but hi, I am Chris. Uh, we don't have any questions coming. Perfect. Through. Okay, Emery. Oh. oh. Let's just do two questions at once, Emery, yeah. and then please introduce yourself and ask a question, and we'll give Zachariah both of them simultaneously. Sure, I'm Anne Marie. I'm a, uh, a faculty member of the Center for Global Affairs. Um, so you were talking about uh, Du Bois's work and um, how it was kind of exposed the false promises of liberal internationalism and the fact that it was a big front for, obviously, the you know inflated um, 
the, what do you call it? Organized greed of, for imperial profit. Um, and uh, that kind of has morphed in contemporary, uh, like the whole history of IR has morphed into defending liberal internationalism and just, you know, contributing to the way that it kind of masks um, maybe not imperial profit, but corporate profit. The fact that, you know, liberal internationalism has become like the smokescreen for legalized legal corruption or illegal theft, legalizing theft, making it happen. Um, so, I mean, this is a, like a, a, a now a very central critique, of course, of IR. Um, it's part of the decolonization of IR and so on. But I'm very interested in the connections you were making with mass protests around this, because, of course, mass protests are, are in fact, you know, protesting corruption, actually, most of the time, corruption and the undermining of democracy and, of course, inter alia racism. I would also argue, in some places, sexism and so on. Wasn't a big part of Du Bois's work, I assume, critiquing the sexism of um, international processes. But when you're making those connections to these mass protests, um, what are you seeing that these often very successful and nonviolent mass pro protests are asking for, if not actually pursuing the core of these liberal ideals, however hypocritical they are in practice? Okay, great. We'll take the second question. Just introduce yourself and answer. Sure. Your Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm a graduate student at the CGA. Um, it kind of ties on to what Professor Stu was discussing. And I think I'm interested about how IR is taught and how practice, practitioners teach IR that's often, yes, rooted in kind of Eurocentricism and realist thinking and liberalist thinking, constructivism, et cetera, that fails to not only center people like Dubois, well, but feminist IR thinking and Marxist thinking. So I guess my question is how, in the academic sense and institutional sense, you shift that kind of teaching, particularly in a time where curriculum reform is so, so difficult to do. Uh, some easy ones for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, in, so the first question in terms of, you know, what are these protests about? And I think that's uh, one of the, the key uh, issues that I've been you know, pondering now for almost a decade. Um, the book that we wrote in 2015 was on African protests in particular. Um, and we wanted to make that intervention because it, you know, we, one of the ways in which the protests were dismissed is because they were not articulating their demands clearly. Right? Um, and people would be like, well, these are just you know, economic protests because they're hungry or uh, these are, you know, uh, political protests because uh, the incumbent is trying to steal a third term, um, but they were not thought of as like coherent movements. Right? Um, and the main argument we make in that book is that, you know, protests are, are fundamentally contingent and dynamic processes, right? And so they, they may start off around a very specific issue, maybe the price of money has gone up, uh, but they can quickly morph uh, into a call for the collapse of the regime, right? Uh, and that if we sort of this sort of narrow way of assessing whether the protest is successful or not, we miss the the, the movements evolve. Um, and I think that's uh, something that we run into constantly. So I uh, pay attention to like, movements like in Argentina, the human management movement around reproductive justice. Right? On one level, that's a very specific movement about abortion rights access. On another level, if you people who are participating and who are theorizing the movement. There, it's a much broader call for, for something else. And what that something else is, is not clearly articulated or defined. And I don't think that's a problem. I'm against, you know, I, the parts of the talk that I didn't get to, is sort of this liberal model of how we think about social movements. It's like, well, social movements define a problem and they work through the legislative process, and they get laws passed, and then we decide that they're successful, right? Um, and they're nonviolent and organized, hierarchical. These are, you know, the classic, you know, there's, there's entire centers in DC uh, called the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, the State Institute for Peace, that will train activists around the world in terms of this is how you be a movement. Right? Um, and I, I, they're all well-meaning people and I've engaged with them. Right? But I think they misread these, these protests right? uh, because they want uh, a clear, coherent narrative. They want a, a charismatic leader. Right? They want a 20-point platform. Um, and they want nonviolence. Right? And most of the movements that I study are none of those. Right? Uh, and so 
what happens then is that we just ignore them. We pretend like, oh, this was a riot. Right? And of course, the regimes involved are like, yeah, they are riots, they're terrorists. And then we're, we feed into that narrative. Right? We say, okay, yeah, well, I didn't see a list of demands, so they're not organized. Uh, they somebody threw a rock through a window, so they're not nonviolent, right? Uh, and we have all these ways of dismissing these movements for being, you know, uh, unclear about their trajectories, their objectives, their demands. Um, but that's not an excuse to to ignore them. I say that, and I also will acknowledge that precisely because of this dynamism inherent in how these movements function, they can make very dark turns. Right? Uh, populism, xenophobia is also a, a part of these same set of energies. Um, and that's why I think it's so like, politically important for us to, to engage with these movements. Sometimes they can be revolutionary, uh, and other times they can be reactionary. And you cannot tell on day one which direction it's going to go, right? um, which is why we should be paying attention to these kinds of forms of, of, of political action, uh, because they have so much potential to determine the trajectory of nations, not the world. Uh, but we can only determine that in, in media rates. Right? We, can't, we can't tell at the outset. And that, that makes it really hard and frustrating, and I get that. But that's not an excuse for us to, to ignore how, how it works. Um, in terms of the, the question of, of, of the curriculum, I, mean, I think that's really fascinating. Right? So, you know, I, I uh, did my PhD in the United States, educated in the United States. And I think one of the key things that, that I have struggled with uh, being a political scientist, an American political scientist, um, is the intermeshing of uh, American political science with the defense and intelligence establishments. Right? Um, all of the ways in which that is kind of just implicitly accepted, or I mean, not even implicitly, explicitly accepted by the discipline, but not named. Right? You cannot name it. Right? So why do I study international politics? Why do I study international relations? I am not doing it to advance American interests. I am against a lot of the foreign policy decisions that my government makes. Hands down, I'm a very strong critic of American interventionism abroad. Hands down. Right? My goal is not to improve American interventions abroad. I think we should pull out. And even stating that is just radical for a political science professor in the US. And it shouldn't be. Right? Because I'm a scholar, I'm an American scholar. I am interested in my country. Right? Uh, and I want to be able to critique US foreign policy openly, publicly, proudly, right, on the syllabi, on in my writing, uh, in a way that you know is just not well, we have a, a field of international relations that is very enmeshed uh, with the foreign policy establishment, the defense community, with the intelligence community, and nobody talks about it. Uh, and it's reflected on our syllabi. Right? You cannot teach Marxist international relations. Like when I was a first year student at Tufts University, which is one of the top undergraduate IR programs in the country, there were no people of color on the international relations syllabus and maybe one woman. Oh well, no, right? that was it. Okay, that's bad, that's egregious. But there were hardly any people outside of Western Europe and North America on the syllabus. There were no Australians or New Zealanders. You, you couldn't get anybody. And so it was like, am I taking a course that's like, you know, by Interests abroad, because that's that's one kind of course, but that's not what I would call international relations, right? Um, and it was just accepted. Right? You can pick up a, a reader on like selection you know, classics of international relations, and you will find these texts which are just filled with all kinds of you know pro-American propaganda. That's how I read it, right? because I had a different set. To, my my canon was different, and so it was like I think as professors. We should be educating our students broadly. Right? You may not like Marxism. Fine. Right? That's great. That's up to you. But you should read Marxist political economy right? because for a whole bunch of people all over Africa, all over Asia, their fundamental understanding of how the world works was encapsulated in things like dependency. And to leave them off an international relations curriculum, if you don't teach dependency theory, that's our academic malpractice. <laughs> it really is. And you <clears throat> they don't. Even today, they don't. So that's my, my personal orientation. Let's take the African-American tradition. So let's say, OK, fine. We don't want those commies. We don't want those third worlders. Let's just get American scholars. 
Du Bois is not taught in IR courses. Ralph Bunch, who was the highest ranking American at the United Nations in history, who was president of the American Political Science Association, first black president of the American Political Science Association, but a PhD in government from Harvard, is never taught in international relations. Never. I, should I, I did my PhD at Bunch Hall, because Ralph <laughs> Bunch like, uh, did his undergrad at UCLA. So the main social sciences building at UCLA is called Ralph Bunch Hall. We walk by his, his bust every day to take the elevator into the political science building. There is no, you would not find Ralph Bunch on a single syllabus being taught throughout the UCLA political science. How does that make sense? Are we supposed to just be blind just to this reality? Are we, are we that naive and that we don't see this? Right? As an undergrad, I remember being 18 years old, going to talk to my students and saying, I took this class because I was interested, interested in international politics. Why is there nothing by a Chinese scholar? Why is there nothing by an Arab or an African or an Indian? Because that's why I'm in this class. Not to read a bunch of professors at Harvard and Stanford. I want to learn about the world. Where can I do that? And where I found that was in African studies. I learned more about India in Africana studies than I did in international relations. And that's a, a sad statement about the field of international relations. What's interesting, I think, that compounds that problem is that when people do look at Chinese international relations scholars, they're, they're critiqued as being, well, this is only a, a means of substantiating or legitimating uh, Chinese foreign policy, where, as if that wasn't also the case for a lot of, for example, real estate really. Any other questions from the people in the room? If not, any any further online or anybody online, Michelle? Uh, nope, there are no questions from the online. Great. Well, then I the only thing left to do is to thank Zachariah very much for his fascinating uh, presentation and to encourage you to you know get that get that that bunch piece out and, and the rest of uh, the rest of the stuff. It's, it's fantastic work. Um, thank you very much, and hopefully we can uh, we can keep up this, this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.